got a tea talk this afternoon, and uh, this is about women and diversity in maritime. And I wanted to introduce, I think, many of the folks on the panel, if you will, you've seen today. I uh, wanted to introduce C. Jean Lau, VP of Customer Experience at Navis, if you'd raise your hand. <laughs> then uh, Silke Eichler, Director of Global Customer Service at Navis. Uh, Sumitha Sempath, who's Vice President of Customer Success at Xvela. And of course, Katie Adamson, who's CEO of Future Nautics and our keynote speaker today. So I'm going to hand it over to you and uh, let's get started. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm very glad and uh, to have you all here and to have you invited to a tea party, <laughs> which seems a bit old fashioned, um, but. Uh, did you know, or did one of you know, that uh, drinking tea is an integral part of the British culture because it was introduced by women into the culture? Because uh, at the time, at the 17th century, it was only women who were allowed to drink in the public and gather. So what they did that was that they made small tea arrangements. And this tea did come, of course, by vessel. And um, Sumita, did you know that um, tea was called differently according to the form of transportation it came? Indeed. It, it was fascinating to learn that if it is shipped by sea, it's referred to as tea. And if it's shipped by land, it's referred to as cha and the various variations such as chai uh, in India and in other places as well. And um, the English introduced tea to India uh, just so that they had a secondary market because they were originally reliant only on China for tea. And they introduced tea and the cultivation and um, the curation in India. And that's sort of how tea um, had these alternate large markets and producing centers. Um, but back to Catherine Braganza. You know, she was this Portuguese princess who married the English king and introduced tea drink, or at least popularized tea drinking in England. Um, and she clearly had a position of power and influence uh, to sort of make this kind of a change. But part of what I always think about is you go to all these conferences and, or, you know, in the industry, there isn't as many women of... Um, making influential changes. So part of what I'm curious to hear from Katie is based on your experience, why do you think this is the case? Thank you. Um, I, I think there's a very simple reason why there aren't more women in maritime, and that's because there aren't more women at sea. Because the maritime industry, the shipping industry traditionally has recruited from the sea for very good reason. Because if you want to come ashore and run a shipping company, you do really need a very good understanding of how ships operate. And the place that you find those people is people who've served on board vessels. So the fact that you don't have many women serving at sea is a direct feed through to the fact that you don't have women ashore and in leadership teams. So I don't think it's any great mystery. Um, I think the question we should be asking is, should that still be the case? Because as we move forward, business is changing and domain expertise is always going to be central because, you know, this is a harsh environment. It's a unique environment, uh, the maritime industry and operating vessels. However, the operation of the vessels is actually not the most critical thing any longer because the operation of the vessels is now dependent on technology and infrastructure, which is actually common across many industries. So there is an opportunity now for us to be saying the skills that we need, although the domain expertise will still need to come from the sea, the other skills that complement those are not necessarily skills that we have to find at sea, which gives us an opportunity to actually have a more diverse workforce. And I think what is difficult for the maritime industry and for shipping professionals, I, I work in maritime and shipping quite often. Um, I have never, in, in all the years that I've been operating, ever felt insulted or belittled or not taken seriously because of my gender. I've never had that experience. I've always found senior leaders in the maritime and shipping industry to be extremely courteous, interested, and open and willing to hear different views. 
However, I think rather than beat up on the industry, we need to recognize that historically there's been a reason for the lack of women, but to draw a line under that and to say we now have the opportunity to change things and actually commercially it will be a good idea to change things and let's come together, stop beating up on each other and find ways to actually improve this. And talking of that, I mean, we had a chat yesterday, Samita, about the programs that you have in Navis, and I was really interested to hear uh, the seriousness with which you're approaching this, very much as a, almost like a commercial project. And if you could share a little bit of that with us. Certainly, certainly. Thank you. So, um, you know, um, there's lots of research out there um, that, you know, having an inclusive workflow for us has impact on the bottom line, right? Um, in terms of, that's because of the innovation that comes from having a diverse workforce. Um, and as, and um, just the ideas and the exchanges that are possible because of uh, different kinds of people in your workforce. Um, now, the, good, the great thing for Navis is that, you know, we have um, the president of Navis who's fully committed to inclusion and diversity in the company. So um, one of the things that we worked on initially as the first thing is to look at, to get the data, right? What do the numbers look like in Navis? So Navis has about 21% uh, representation in terms of gender, women, globally. Um, and there are regional differences. EMEA definitely has a higher percentage than um, the rest of the world, whether it is APAC or the United States. So once we had the baseline data, the question was, where do we go from here? And we took a very, uh, what we think is a simple achievable target of 1% increase in the gender diversity in Navis by the end of this year. And um, well, it was, it was really great to have that uh, goal and the KPI to begin with, but then that was just the start because you have to now say, okay, how do you execute on this strategy? And we are using a three-pronged approach. Uh, you know, the first one we call uh, recruit and hire. Uh, the second one we called invest and retain, and the third one's called educate and enable. Now, this is a global initiative. However, I have partners in the region, and that's why we have Selke here, who's representing EMEA, and C. Jean from APAC, um, to sort of take the strategy and look at it from a regional perspective and do whatever is necessary to customize it for the region. And I'm sure Selke and C. Jean will talk about it um, in a bit. But what I also wanted to highlight is that um, we've, not only do we have a global target of 1% increase in gender diversity, we've sort of backed it to say, okay, how do you enable hiring managers to achieve these targets? So, well, you have to go and make sure that your talent acquisition team is providing hiring managers with enough diverse resumes so they could actually achieve the target. So then you go downstream and you start putting targets on the talent acquisition team and um, it, they are now required to at least submit 30% diverse resumes to the hiring manager, and in certain cases, up to 50% diverse resume, right? And then we put in programs like training for interviewing manager, women in interview panel, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the invest and retain track, we just are wrapping up the first mentoring program because we do know that women and, you know, not just women, but pe diverse people of diverse backgrounds need um, sponsorship and mentorship just so that they are, there is a bit of an equity, right? Because we do know data suggests that there's only certain kinds of people who repeatedly get stretch assignments and promotions and so forth. And mentoring and sponsoring is a, is a way for high level leaders to work with people from different backgrounds that they normally may not work together on and bring, bring fresh ideas into the picture. And last but not least, on the educate and enable track, it's all about running programs and initiatives, whether it is going to the Grace Hopper Conference or whether you run internal programs. But the idea being that you know you continue to educate and invest in that. So uh, it's a multi-pronged approach. It's it's run like any other strategic business initiative. KPIs are reported out. People are measured against targets, and that makes it. Um, more real, right? It, you're walking the talk now. Now, let me ask Selke to add some details about how she is customizing the program for EMEA. 
Yeah, um, like you already said, in EMEA we are quite well off with the percentage of women um, regarding the, the total number of employees. We are at 31% at the moment, which is a lot. So um, we decided not so much on focus on recruiting and hire, but we decided to move the program a little bit forward and look into retention. So uh, what we have done is that we have set up um, a questionnaire for in the first place, um, asking women in our company what they would need, uh, what they would like to see, how they would think their workplace should look like, if they need more flexibility and in which parts of the work they need more flexibility. So we are currently um, working on the results of that and we are of course um, very sure that uh, the works on this result will be nothing that you see very quickly. It is something that is, has to do with sustainability, with changing our work environment in a sustainable way which, take, which takes its time. Um, on the other hand, we decided to concentrate a little bit more um, on the cultural diversity as um, we are located in northern Germany. We have about 65 people in the office and we have about 17 or 18 different nations. So um, we started a, a, some cultural programs. One of it is called the Diversity Bridge where we encourage people from... Um, non-German countries in the first place um, to introduce their country um, to their colleagues and um, they can choose how they want to do it. What we have done is for instance a Turkish food, work food workshop in the lunch break um, or we have also um, taken um, people out to typical northern German places so they learn something about northern German culture and um, we have uh, also focused on a thing that I really like, uh, which is the thank you of the month. So um, we have a uh, thank you um, in different languages, one language per month. It is spread all over the office. And I have really encountered uh, that when I tried to uh, twist my tongue and pronounce thank you to my Turkish colleague. She was very, very uh, delighted to hear that I do it. Um, we have also transferred this program to Oakland now, and Oakland will also start that. So this is what we have been doing. And um, see, Jean, let's hear what you've been doing. Thank you, Silke. I think um, for APAC, we have to customize it for each of the region. And, and APAC and Asia Pacific is very different from the other regions to a certain degree. Uh, we're not as diverse as the other regions. Um, when I talk about not as diverse, we, we spread across all the way from Australia down to, to India and Bangladesh and coverage of people that we have in the region. The majority of the people that we have in, in Asia Pacific is based in India, in Chennai. Uh, and the majority of those people, we, you know, we have about 200 plus engineers, 30 plus of them are women. So again, we're not moving the needle in the number of female engineers that we have in the, the, the company. So we, we basically focused around those areas. How can we hire more females as engineers? And I think, as you pointed out, that there are less people coming into the industry. It's not just the maritime business, but even in the technology industry itself, there are fewer women coming into the industry as well as men. So trying to raise that level of interest is a challenge. And a lot of people feel that you know, engineering or IT is such a complex part of you know, a job than compared to a job in the accounting side or working for a finance company, it's a little bit more easier to consume. That being an engineer as a female, it's not that easy to sort of adapt and your parents will say, question you, why are you going in to be an engineer? It's a hard job. It's a, it's a long hours working environment. You're gonna be with, with a lot of men in the company that are doing engineering type work and are you up for it? So a lot of women are challenged just based on the economics and the social environment of being an engineer. And so they sort of steer away from that. Uh, but the interesting fact that they, there are a lot of women that are very strong and very powerful engineers, as we found out in our own company. Uh, but the way to accommodate that as well in Navis, we've been able to sort of change the culture by allowing our female colleagues to start to have families. So we allow them to go home in the middle of the day or during, you know, go home early so that they can you know, do things at home, do the family cooking, look after kids, but at the same time, they go back to work. So allowing that flexibility 
has raised that level of interest of female engineers to join the company. So it's interesting to sort of make those dynamic, very, di very different changes to accommodate that as well. So other than all of the social events that we host in, in Chennai, uh, but the most important thing is creating a culture for women to join the company uh, and also create opportunities for promotions because that's one of the key areas that we've not done a very good job and that's one of the areas that we want to focus on is creating promotional and management positions for the female uh, colleagues in the company, particularly in Chennai. Um, and that's one of the sort of key areas that we tend to look at and as we do have those quarterly or monthly um, tea sessions that we have in Chennai, that we do actually sit down and say, what can we do more as a company to be able to give more opportunities to our female colleagues for promotions? Uh, and then mentoring is another piece which I'm very, very interested in. And I have a, quite a few uh, mentees in my parts of the world, um, and they, they love it. And they've been given opportunity to be mentored by someone not sitting in India, but someone who's able to give and share knowledge and experience has helped them tremendously. So that's another focus that we do differently in, in the Asia-Pacific region. So I'll hand this back to you, sir. Thank you, CJ. So I want to go back to you, Katie. So going back to your presentation this morning and about um, Industry 4.0 and the disruptive technology trends that you're seeing, how do you see um, the future play out? And given you're a futurist, I'm curious to hear from you. Uh, how, how do you see the future of the workforce, whether it is gender or ethnic or uh, cohort, whether it's millennials or not? What, what, what is your view about how things are going to pan out in the next 10, 15, 20 years? <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I think one of the things that you picked up on there is the fact that, you know, if it's women to encourage them that you need to give them the flexibility to go home and cook food, look after kids, etc. In fact, literally five minutes ago, I got a text from my youngest daughter in the UK saying, Mom, in capital letters, please fill up my lunch card. I have no money for lunch. So just before this, I was sitting there filling up my daughter's lunch card. Yeah. But we all do that not just women, and particularly as the world changes, more and more men are recognizing that actually that is a shared responsibility. So I don't think it's going to be so much in the future about creating a workplace that is hospitable for women. It's going to be about a drive from all members of the workforce, that everybody should be understood, that they are all taking those kind of responsibilities. I think it is something from a specifically from a female perspective. We have to bear in mind that globally, something like 60, 70% of all domestic responsibilities still fall on women. So that is the backdrop to us trying to improve representation in the workplace. And that's something that the maritime industry or you know, no one company can solve, but actually everyone coming together to change the way that we work, to change the culture in our workplaces. So it's no longer you know, the person who gets there earliest in the morning and leaves latest at night you know, is, the, is the winner. This is the problem that, that we've had up until now, and I think what the millennial uh, generation and the Gen Zs behind them seem to have worked out is that nobody wants to work like that. It's not a question of you being a woman and not being able to and therefore being disadvantaged, that the people who are able to work like that are still disadvantaged because they're expected to do it. And that's when you get resentment because you're saying, well, how come these women are allowed to go home at three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, when I'm here till eight o'clock in the evening? So, Again, you come to an equality thing here. You need to make sure that these workplaces are equitable. And I think that stems from changing the systems that we operate in. And I think part of this as well is we are geared up at the moment to retain people. You know, you spend a lot of time and money and energy training people up and then you want to keep them. And of course, what the millennials are teaching us is we ain't gonna, we ain't gonna keep them. You know, they're going, they might spend two, three years with you and then they're off somewhere else. Portfolio careers is what they're interested in. So what companies need to do, and I kind of mentioned this uh, in our chat yesterday, I think what companies have to be really smart about doing is in institutionalizing some of that knowledge, is in using things like AI and automation to capture some of the knowledge so that they can afford for people to dip in and out of organizations rather than losing all that expertise that they've invested in. And obviously there's a balance to be had there. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to go too far on the automation side, but I think it's worth thinking about the extent to which you can capture that knowledge and that expertise, particularly as we have a, a changing workforce. And bear in mind that, you know, average life expectancy is, is growing all the time. Uh, you know, in the UK, my daughters could live to 110, 120. That means they could work until they're 100. I wish you could see their faces when I say that around the dinner table, you know, particularly to keep me in the style to which I'd like to become accustomed, yeah. But that reality is that you can't work the way we have worked 
and generations before up to the age of 60, 65. You know, you can't do that for 30 years longer. You know, retirement is likely to be something that uh, certainly, you know, my grandchildren will probably never experience. So there's an entire change in the way we approach work, and that's going to be driven by technology, by AI, by demographics, and also by our own expectations. Uh, what it's going to look like exactly, I don't know, but I think everything is up for grabs. Um, thank you, Katie. And I saw Derek give me the two-minute uh, warning here. So I'd, I'd like to wrap up this uh, tea talk here. And um, first of all, thank you, everybody, to who been around listening. Um, if you are not a novice person, and if your company has uh, initiatives that are aimed at inclusion and diversity, gender, or any other metric, I and we would be really curious to hear from you offline to see you know, where you are in the journey, because at the end of the day, this is a journey, and we are all at different points in this journey. So that's um, a request from those of you outside of Navis. Uh, you know, if there's something interesting in your world, um, we'd more than happy and eager to hear that. And if you are a Navis employee and who hasn't been familiar with these initiatives that are in the company, uh, again, please let us know, because there is opportunity to engage and um, see how we could bring in the broader uh, workforce into this conversation. And last but, last but not least, I would say that um, the key to any change um, when it comes to gender diversity and women in particular is not the women, it's the men in the company. And um, from that perspective, you know, I'm extremely grateful to the Navis executive team um, who have thrown their support uh, behind this initiative. And... Um, Thank you, Bruce, for taking on targets. In addition to your sales targets, you've taken on diversity targets, which uh, I deeply appreciate. Thank you, everybody. Yes, uh, before we finish, Bruce, could you come over for a picture here? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.